So good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I wanted to first thank the Canadian Council for Southeast Asian Studies for inviting me to give one of the keynotes for this conference. It's definitely an honor for me to be addressing you today and a great privilege to be able to participate in some small way in this very rich and diverse conference. As was mentioned in the exceedingly kind introduction, I specialize in the study of Southeast Asia's indigenous uh, minorities, in particular, the Lumad peoples of Mindanao. Lumad refers to a category of indigenous minority ethnic groups in the Southern Philippines, consisting of 18 or so distinct ethno-linguistic groups and many more subgroups and sub-dialects of those groups. Uh, Lumads are typically uh, distinguished from their neighboring Moros or the indigenous minorities who had converted to Islam in pre-colonial times. While Lumads and Moros coexisted and sometimes allied with each other throughout their history, the Lumads generally paid tribute to one or more of the Moro sultanates. I work closely in the field with one particular Lumad group known as the Higaonon, but in my archival and ethno-historical work, I deal with the Lumadnon more broadly because the ethno-linguistic groupings of today are not necessarily the same as in previous centuries. As the title of my talk says, I'd like to talk about, well, I mean, really more specifically pan, um, epidemics. Um, so not about COVID or a specific disease, uh, but more about the epidemic as an idea, as a catalyst for cultural and other types of transformation, and as a phenomenon that can spark radical social movements in Southeast Asia. In particular, I wanted to discuss the epidemic within the context of peri-colonial spaces among the peoples on Southeast Asia's fringes. As opposed to the region's classical, early modern and colonial centers, Southeast Asia's peri-colonial spaces are places and temporalities that lay outside the reach of your typical centers of political, religious, um, colonial and other authority. But I use the term in a specific way and uh, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, I will be focusing on the epidemic from the Lumad perspective because I thought it might be interesting to bring an historical and cultural dimension to our understanding of the global phenomenon that we've been experiencing for the past two years. I also want us to think about the peri-colonial spaces of Southeast Asia to show a bit of how responsive and dynamic these communities really are. Uh, these are communities that are typically thought of as being more traditional in terms of um, culture and social organization because being outside the region's cultural and political centers where everything uh, happens, uh, they're normally presumed to have had less exposure to outside influences and are thus seen as static and unchanging. Sometimes this lack of exposure is even framed as a political choice, framed as resistance. But as I will show, dynamism and radical change are in fact deeply embedded in their cult cultural traditions. Rather than cultural preservation and resistance to change, it is instead the stories of change and innovation that are celebrated and commemorated in their oral traditions. So I'll be talking about two notable instances in Lumad ethno history involving epidemics in North Central Mindanao uh, during the Spanish colonial era um, and the American um, uh, colonial era. And I'll be discussing their enduring significance to modern Lumad, modern day Lumad communities. Uh, I'm, I'll be talking about the Ulaging epic and the Tungud movement. The Tungud movement was a millenarian movement that took place at the beginning of the American colonial period and we know about it because it was documented contemporaneously by John Garvin, an American ethnographer who did field research with the Agusan Manobo in, in the early 1900s. Um, it tells of an epidemic disease that then becomes a driver for major social, political, and territorial transformations in the Lumad world long before Philippine independence. The Olaging, on the other hand, is an oral tradition that is found widely among the Higaonon and closely related Lumad communities, especially Manobo communities, possibly dating back to the colonial era, to the Spanish colonial era. And, and there are quite a few published studies um, about versions of the Olaging found in different Lumad communities. And I would like to mention in particular the work of local scholars, Elena Maquizo, Carmen Onabia, Ludivina Opeña, Francisco Col Ompolenda, Tranquilino Sitoy, Datu Miketa uh, Victorino Sawai, and Nicole Revel. And so even though most of us don't think of oral literature as history, 
Like all oral traditions, uh, this epic has something to say about the Luman past. Think of it as something that gives meaning and structure to how people interpret the past, whether their own or that of others. Uh, and it's therefore extremely valuable to understand the kinds of events that their ancestors experienced or were concerned about. In ethnohistory, these oral traditions are like a frame or a paradigm uh, that we can use to understand the past, just like how in conventional history, we have conceptual frames like colonialism and capitalism and nationhood that structure our understanding. Uh, epidemiology is also one such frame through which we can make sense of the past. Understanding such frames um, is particularly important when dealing with events and peoples in what I have been calling pericolonial spaces. These are the spaces that lie outside of what we normally deal with in terms of historiography and historical knowledge. While there are centers of spiritual and political power, centers of culture, centers of commerce and trade, etc., there are also naturally peripheries. In Southeast Asian studies, we talk about a dichotomy between coasts and interiors, lowlands and uplands, uh, urban centers and rural peripheries, the centers of mandalas versus the ungovernable zomias. Um, so there are many ways of talking about these spaces, each with their own intellectual baggage. But in writing up my own ethno-historical research, which formed the basis of, of uh, my, my 2013 book, um, A Mountain of Difference, uh, I coined the term pericolonial because I wanted to get away from the idea of resistance, from the presumption that the people who lived on the so-called fringes um, either regarded themselves as peripheral in any way, or that they were choosing to li live in these spaces because they were somehow resisting civilization or were some type of proto-anarchists. I thought it was important to do this because framing the fringe as spaces of resistance or refuge only reinforces the centering of centers and doesn't really allow us to appreciate these spaces and these peoples in their own right. In the case of my book, I wanted to write a history for the kind of peoples that Eric Wolf once described as being without history. I wanted to show that Lumad peoples in Mindanao, who are almost always described as having resisted colonialism and all other external influences at times, at times violently so, um, that they instead had their own significant encounter with uh, colonialism. And as my book shows, it was an encounter that transformed them culturally, politically, and in other ways into who they are today. In framing Lumad spaces as pericolonial, I meant that these spaces, both as place and as temporality, uh, were outside the ambit of colonial power rather than at its fringe. In, now, in contrast to your uh, typical colonial contact zone, uh, which after, after Pratt, um, in which um, actors meet, clash, and grapple under asymmetrical relations of power, that's actually a quote, um, for me, pericolonial spaces are particular points in terms of place and time where indigenous and colonizer could or had to interact on more or less a neutral plane and where any cultural or material exchange was undertaken without compulsion, or at least initially. That's why the temporalities part is important here. So for Southeast Asia in the early modern period, I think that there's an argument to be made for recognizing the existence of these spaces even within areas claimed by colonial power. The Southern Philippines, for example, was part of the colonial territory claimed by Spain. But we know that in reality, they never controlled more than a few coastal slivers. Uh, and it was not until the American colonial period that uh, the South was uh, actually incorporated in a tangible way into the Philippine geo body. In my mind, that distinction is important, especially when this part of Southeast Asia has long been dismissed in Philippine historiography as a colonial backwater where nothing of consequence happened over three centuries of Spanish colonial occupation that radically transformed the Philippines into, into well, in, into the Philippines. Um, so first I wanted to talk a little bit about epidemic disease and how it informs the past for us in the case of Lumads. Um, I confess to having a limited layman, layman's understanding of epidemic disease. It's not my area of specialty by any means. Um, and I lean here very heavily on Ken de Beauvoir's 1995 book, Agents of Aco uh, um, Apocalypse, which is mainly about the outbreak of disease at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. These were outbreaks of such ferocity that colonial physicians described them in ap apocalyptic terms. Uh, 
um, apocalyptic, meaning it felt kind of like the end of the world. And it may be, it may seem dramatic to use those, uh, that term, but in real terms, it, it really was apocalyptic uh, for those concerned. And according to De Beauvoir's, um, according to his research, Philippine morbidity and mortality rates um, at the time were the world's highest. So this is the period between 1883 and 1903 um, in his research. Um, so there was a series of epidemics that brought two centuries of vigorous population growth to a grinding halt. So to put it in perspective, um, in the two centuries before, before that uh, time, uh, 1655 to 1877, uh, the Philippines experienced a 13 fold growth in population. So that's over two centuries. Now that's quite considerable because in comparison, the world population, not just the Philippines, but the world population has only increased sevenfold in the past 200 years. So that means the 19th and 20th centuries. But in this period at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries, um, the Philippine population dropped uh, by point, uh, well dropped well below um, replacement levels. So it's, 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 uh, this, this sort of population loss is, is quite significant. One qualifier here, though, is that uh, De Beauvoir's research does not include the upland tribal areas of the Philippines because they were relatively isolated um, compared to today, and there were no public health services available there. So people were basically were born, uh, fell ill, and died without any official medical record of these events. Um, and that's not surprising since this is a characteristic of these kinds of peri-colonial spaces. On the other hand, the public health records we do have for the rest of the Philippines at the time uh, we're also not very good or very incomplete uh, with a lot of deaths also unrecorded or misattributed. Most people did not go to hospitals or medical doctors for treatment, but to local healers who did not keep such records. Um, so there's no way of having complete data. Nonetheless, the data that uh, we do have gives us a very clear picture of what was going on. The epic um, so the epidemic diseases that we're talking about here were mainly malaria, tuberculosis, smallpox, dysentery, and other gastrointestinal diseases, and cholera, all very nasty diseases. Uh, and this was on top of other endemic diseases like typhoid, influenza, and fever diseases, upper respiratory diseases. De Beauvoir also mentions an alarming rise in beriberi at the time, which was caused by malnutrition resulting from the spread of cash crop agriculture um, during this period. And so this is another major transition um, um, taking place in the Philippines at the time. And we know that despite their relative isolation, the Lumads were affected, you know, in the uplands of Mindanao were affected by all of these diseases because they are mentioned in historical accounts, um, especially pertaining to cholera. And Lumads were also involved in cash cropping, though to a smaller scale than lowland mainstream Filipino communities. So I want to focus here on cholera because it's mentioned specifically in relation to the historically documented Tungud movement, Asiatic cholera in particular. So back, bacterial disease back then um, had a really high fatality rate, ranging from 50 to 70 percent. Um, it was, and I quote from De Beauvoir, a terrifying disease that ravaged whole communities at a time. Its course was sudden, swift, virulent, agonizingly painful, and most often fatal, unquote. Even mere rumors of cholera resulted in panic and in a few instances, riots. And it remains dangerous to this day, actually. Um, so one feature you'll appreciate in light of COVID-19, um, not everyone exposed to cholera became infected and many of those who did get infected were asymptomatic. Other features included uh, that you had fake cures um, and preventative medicines that were sometimes worse than the actual disease, even fatal. Um, public sanitation was atrocious by today's standards. Um, and there was no real treatment at the time except for isolation and quarantine to prevent spread. So basically cholera went unchecked during that time. So if you can just imagine COVID-19 today, but without any hospitals, ICUs, no advanced medical knowledge, no way to test until you had symptoms that showed up just hours before almost certain death, no protective equipment, no way to disseminate the necessary information on disease prevention in a rapid and reliable way. Cholera pandemics in the um, early 19th century returned several times throughout island Southeast Asia. And in the mid 1860s, it finally spread all the way to Mindanao by way of Zamboanga. Uh, 
uh, in the 1880s, there was an outbreak in Zamboanga um, that led to 40% of the population becoming infected. And it killed one in six of the total population in the main poblacion, the main, basically the main um, uh, urban area. Uh, and it rapidly spread outwards. In the outer districts, the death rate was over 10% of the total population. As with all epidemics, death rates among the poor and those in poor health were disproportionately high. And, and I quote here, within a few days of the outbreak, victims were already dying too fast to keep up with burials. And those charged with carrying out the corpses frequently felt the, the first symptoms in the street. Death commonly came within a few hours, unquote, end quote. So one interesting thing that Devois notes uh, is that uh, he saw boat, um, he uh, found documentation that boatloads of food were being taken out to sea and overturned so that evil spirits would let the people live in peace, but to no apparent avail. And so this is what I'd like to turn to next. Um, the fact that at the time, despite science already having germ theory of disease, most of us in the Philippines had our own cultural theories about disease and illness that gravitated towards the supernatural. And this wasn't limited to the so-called so primitive Lumad groups. We know that Moro groups, mainstream Filipino groups also thought this way. And I imagine it was the same throughout Southeast Asia. Many of us in the Philippines still regard illness and disease as having um, a uh, spiritual or supernatural component, um, despite our now widespread reliance and faith in modern medicine. Um, so, people in Mindanao making offerings to angry spirits as a way to fight an epidemic was at the time a perfectly logical way to respond. So if you can imagine the appearance of a disease like cholera in the uplands and its subsequent behavior, its mysterious asymptomatic spread, rapid progression and, 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 and so on, uh, it would have been interpreted supernaturally as being caused by spirits acting out in anger. The kind of fear and panic that this would have generated is something we can easily imagine. So with that in mind, I'd like to turn uh, first to the Tungod movement, which took place over several years around the first decade of the 20th century. Um, it's described by the American anthropologist, John Garvin in chapter 29 of his book, The Manobos of Mindanao, um, as the great religious movement of 1908 to 1910 called it great because it was widespread and not centered on one specific Lumad group, but in fact, it was a multicultural movement that affected in his estimation, one third of the Lumad population of Mindanao. And so I'm quoting from his uh, chapter here, among the Christianized and non-Christianized Manobos, Mandayas, Mansakas, Mangwangans, and Dibabaons, I only know of a few men and of not a single woman or child old enough to walk who did not partake in it, end quote. And it even had uh, a few uh, Visayan adherents. Uh, these are people from mainstream um, Filipino population. As to its origins, uh, the movement started when a Manobo man named Mapakla, uh, um, uh, also known as Miskinan, came down with cholera. The only thing anyone could do in the face of cholera at the time, as I've already explained, was to flee. So, um, uh, Miskinan was abandoned by his relatives, his community, uh, and all of them were fearing for their lives at this, you know, because of this supernatural deadly disease. And then three days later, he recovers miraculously and um, appears to his relocated community, apparently healed completely by a benevolent spirit, he said, that had a supernatural cure, not only for this disease, but for all suffering. He also warned of an apocalypse coming, the end of the world. Um, and he had commands from this benevolent spirit that people were supposed to follow. So in this respect, Miskinan is behaving very much like your standard religious prophet. So according to him, according to the spirit, uh, the world was gonna end. And if you wanted to be saved, you needed to take certain precautions to save yourself. So this included killing, killing your animals or they will end up devouring you. Stop planting or tending to your crops. Uh, devote yourself exclusively to certain religious rituals dictated by the spirit through the prophet Meskinan. Um, and other elements of the movement, including offering all your heirlooms and other material possessions, as well as food and other resources to Meskinan uh, and, and his priests. Meskinan was reported by eyewitnesses, including people known personally by John Garvin, as being, quote, truly a, a deity whose body was golden, 
um, and that he was reported to be totally free of any disease or deformity and that he no longer needed to eat or do normal human functions. Uh, and I quote, he ate only the fragrance of offerings made to him, unquote. So he becomes kind of very godlike in, in this, uh, becomes supernatural himself. Um, the reward for being a lo loyal fo follower was that you would be spared from death and further suffering at the end of the world. Uh, and I quote here, all would live a life of darkness and despair, but those who had complied with instructions would be saved. Their bodies at the moment of the fall of the world would become golden and they would fly around in the air with never a care for material wants, the men on their shields and the women on their combs. Now, one interesting note here is that this pattern resembles religious revitalization movements led by bailans or shamans among Manobo speaking groups, uh, which I've written about before uh, in an article entitled True Believers, which came out in 2006. Garvin himself notes at the very end of, of that chapter that, uh, quote, religious revivals of similar character may be looked for periodically, perhaps every 10 or 15 years, especially on the occurrence of public perils such as contagious diseases and fear of invasion, end quote. Which suggests that this was not a unique or isolated event, uh, but more a pattern in how these communities responded to certain stressors. That is to say, instead of hunkering down in terms of crisis, Lumad communities tended to respond with a massive overhaul of the status quo to the point of dissolving ethnic boundaries and creating brand new communities. And now the outcome of the Tungud movement was not, of course, um, the end of the world. And like other similar religious movements, uh, prophetic movements, it just fizzled out once followers lost faith or the prophet or the bailan died. However, it did bring about massive social change in the process, including cross-cultural population movement all over, uh, all over the Lumad areas of Mindanao, with new settlements sprouting up in response to accommodate the movements of adherents. What we know reliably about this movement is of course limited to Garvin's account, but we do know that it reorganized Lumad life on a major scale across many different ethnic groups. In other words, it was a social movement triggered by cholera that resulted in massive social and cultural change. So now I want to turn to the Olaging, which as I've said before, is part of oral tradition and not from conventional historical record. The epic um, called Olaging or Olagingin or Olahingin, or more simply the epic of Agu after the main character. Uh, this is an oral literature form or epic, an epic shared by the Manobo speaking Lumad groups, including the Hikaonon, the Bukidnon, Talaanding, and of course all the Manobo subgroups like Agusan and Manobo, Aroman and Manobo, and, and the like. Um, so, like all oral literatures, uh, there are seemingly endless varieties and versions of the Olaging, depending on, uh, in part, on where it is recited, as well as the audience. The recorded versions we have of it are all from the latter half of the 20th century, uh, mainly from the 1960s onwards, and it's, it's still an active oral, um, uh, it's still an active epic um, that's recited uh, in Lumad communities today. So. In theory, the Ulaging is a story and a tradition that predates the Tungud movement and predates the colonial period. It is also a true epic uh, with so many well-developed um, storylines. It's sophisticated um, in narrative form and it's widespread among Manobo speaking Lumad groups. Um, for this reason, it's uh, presumed uh, to be of significant antiquity. However, the narratives are always about stuff that happened during the colonial period. So in truth, we don't know when the Ulaging originated. It very well could have come after the Tungud movement. Um, and it could in fact be the original Manobo narrative of the Tungud movement. Um, it's not mentioned in Garvin's account, although it could have been simply because he didn't know to ask about it. Um, so uh, as for the epic as an, a very oversimplified summary, the Ulaging tells the story of Agu and his relatives and allies as they make their way from the coast of Mindanao to the interior of Mindanao, where ultimately they are saved by supernatural beings who rapture them to a heavenly immortal plane where they continue to have adventures but have no physical suffering. The Uliging takes place at a time where there's great hardship in the world. And there's many different versions of these hardships. Um, it, it's there, depending on the version, it's either disease, drought, famine, raids, raids by Moros or Spaniards, um, Chinese price gouging, Japanese invasion, intertribal warfare, et cetera. So all the versions are slightly different in, in terms of the, the catalyst for 
uh, movement. And Agyu and his community basically flee to the interior to avoid this hardship, whatever it may be. Um, as for the main storyline, uh, you know, within the context of sort of broader hardship, uh, there's a woman named Mungan, who's the wife of Banlak, another, these are all main characters, who develops a disfiguring and disabling disease, which means that she cannot walk and must be carried. We don't know what disease this is in medical terms. Um, it could be almost anything. One version says leprosy, but not others. Uh, the only important point is that it's contagious. It's a contagious disease. Um, and so she's abandoned by the rest of her community and her relatives um, as they flee for safety. A few days later, she reappears to her community, this time with a perfect body that is golden and emanating light. And she says she was made immortal by supernatural beings who gave her um, instructions for them to follow. And of course her body is, is um, you know, in this, in this golden shining state. Um, she's of course totally free of all disfigurement and disease. Um, so as with the Tungud movement, the plot of the Ulaging fo follows the same structure of bilan, bilan revitalization movements. So uh, I wanted to just read briefly from something that I've written on the topic. The, the pattern of bilan movements tends to be as follows. During a time of great crisis or stress, a bailan receives a message from supernatural beings that soon the world will be turned upside down and the chosen people will be delivered from their hardship. Instructions are given to abandon settlements and crops, kill all domestic animals, and proceed to a distant location to await further instruction. The reason um, for these instructions is that when the world ends as we know it, the order of things will be reversed. Domestic animals will devour their owners. Those experiencing sickness of, and hardship will become perpetually healthy and prosperous. With this prophecy, the Bailan leads his followers to a paradise where, if they follow his instructions, they would become libung, which translates as either raptured or um, uh, the Jesuit Vincent Cullen translates it as instant happy immortality, um, after which they become immortal and are no longer dependent on food and drink. This transformation will take place when followers enter paradise, either by being lifted through a hole in the sky or walking into a secret um, opening in, the, in a mountain. Now the mountains um, you know, in, in these, in these um, uh, bailan movements are uh, said to be somewhere in Mindanao, um, uh, most often reckoned to be Mount Balatukan in the Pantaran range between uh, Bukidnon and Misamis or Intel provinces, uh, where I'm from. Uh, so, Anyway, so such movements are obviously revitalization movements that are millenarian, meaning that they're about an apocalyptic world transformation engineered by the supernatural. Um, and of course, the, the disease, the epidemic disease is just uh, another symptom of, of this sort of supernaturality. Now, the key word here is um, just ask the, 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 the key word for um, how people experience these, these epidemics, these pandemics in the past is ap apocalyptic a situation of world ending crisis uh, that results in basically radical social change. And so I want to emphasize this because a common stereotype of indigenous peoples, such as the Lumad groups, Cordilleran groups and other indigenous peoples around the world, um, not just in the Philippines, um, is that they are resistant to change and are extremely traditional, um, even archaic in their cultural practices. In the Philippines, it's even a common belief that the cultures and traditions of indigenous peoples is some, are somehow still pre-colonial and that we can see in them an exemplar of pre-Spanish Filipino cultures untouched by the radical transformations of colonialism, Christianity and Westernization. However, in my own research, I've found that the deeper you de delve into Luma traditions and history, the more you find that they were in fact profoundly transformed by all the things that transformed all Filipinos. The only difference is that their experiences varied in key ways, resulting in, slightly different, in a slightly different outcome. In other words, just because they look very different from um, uh, the mainstream today, culturally speaking, it doesn't mean that they did not also experience radical changes over the past four centuries of colonialism and Westernization. In fact, the oral histories of the Lumad are filled with narratives about radical social change, beginning with the Olaging epic. Furthermore, their genealogies memorialize ancestors who introduced new practices or led them to new territories, new settlements, and, and not uh, not filled with people who avoided change or resisted change. In the Olaging, the place where the people of Agyu uh, wait for immortality is called Nalandangan. 
uh, which is described by Mardonio Lau, um, a, um, a, uh, a scholar from Bukidnon, um, in his book, Bukidnon and Historical Perspective. Um, so he describes it this way, uh, quoting from a recital uh, of the epic. Um, so he translates it in verse form. Um, Multitudes lived there, thousands stayed there. They were not the same, they were not alike. There were those who were rulers, there were those who received tribute. So this basically describes, um, and the rest of it, describes a large multicultural community drawn together by a religious movement based on the preaching of Mungan, who was transformed into an immortal being after being riddled with disease. So um, um, I could go on, but I think I should stop here and try to come to some sort of um, concluding point for this talk. Um, so getting back to the late 1800s and early 1900s with the deadly outbreaks of epidemic diseases that eventually reached Mindanao, um, even without what was going on in the Tagalog revolution um, uh, at the time and later the American occupation, or, or perhaps because of these events, um, this was a catastrophic period, ep um, not only epidem epidemiologically speaking, but also in other ways. And we also know from various accounts that people were dying in the upland areas around this time, although um, from the famous account by the Frenchman um, uh, Joseph Montano, this was due to revenge raiding between tribal communities and not due to epidemic disease. Um, in Montano's analysis, quote, the interior of Mindanao was on the verge of depopulating itself through intertribal warfare, unquote, end quote. But did this depopulation result from warfare or did the warfare result from the instability brought on by epidemic disease? Or did raiding simply exacerbate an epidemic situation? What we can probably say is whatever the situation on the ground at the time, it was likely intensified further by disease and by the intensification of colonialism. But the thing about epidemics is that it's not just about virus, viruses or bacteria. Um, we can see that a lot of other factors influence the way uh, that they play, the ways that they play out if we regard these things um, as holistically as possible. For example, we can see from today's pandemic, a lot of factors, including political control, capitalist structures and pressures, poverty and inequality and um, environmental pressures, um, um, among other things, are all shaping in important ways what and how um, uh, COVID as a, um, how COVID-19 as a disease is playing out in, in, in individual countries um, or in, uh, in North America in individual provinces and individual states. So the same thing should be considered for the epidemic in Lumad ethno history and um, how it's placed itself out, resulting in social movements that radically transformed the Lumad communities that they in, um, affected. We know capitalism is one trigger for epidemic disease, and this is also true of colonialism, of ecological and social uh, disruption, um, anything that causes imbalances, instability, et cetera. Um, these things can be causal, but could also be unintended consequences of epidemic disease. In the narratives of the historical Tungud movement that started with the Manobos um, uh, and the shared Manobo epic of Agu's people called the Olaging, there is a cultural memory of past catastrophic events triggered by disease, or more, specific, uh, more precisely, actually, fear of epidemic disease, um, including the supernatural aspects of epidemic disease that drove multiple communities in pericolonial spaces to undergo radical transformations in terms of religion and culture, in terms of settlement and migration, um, in terms of forming multicultural communities and creating brand new identities, as well as the corresponding radical changes in their material conditions. Um, and we have yet to understand fully how these social movements might have transformed Lumad peoples into the indigenous communities that we see today. Uh, but we might be able to begin appreciating that events like epidemics and pandemics can have a significant impact even in the spaces that are for the most part invisible in terms of the historical record. Even though they are in effect peoples outside of history, they are nonetheless intensely and intimately responsive to the same events that shape those of us on the inside. Rather than being inoculated from change, uh, peoples on the so-called fringe of Southeast Asia may instead be primed for it. 